I focus a bit more on ground up development and what is typically meant by ground up development is, you know, you're taking a property that is, you know, just the ground and you are developing it by putting, you know, you are developing it up by putting a building on it. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I am your host, Whitney Sewell. We are back again today with our guest, Andrew Brewer. He's He's got many years and, and uh, lots of experience in ground up development. Uh, we're going to dive into different aspects of this asset class, whether you are active or passive. I know you're going to learn a lot today. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the show or leave a rating, written review. We would be forever grateful. Andrew, welcome back to the show. Honored to do a few segments with you and to dive into your expertise that you've honed in on in this ground up development. I'm looking forward to learning more about that. I know the listeners are as well. As I heard yesterday more about your background and getting into this space and you know the support you have at home around you know, pushing into the just entrepreneurial drive that you and your wife have. So welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Let's jump into, you know, ground up development like that. And I hear the term value add all, all the time. And let's talk about the difference between those two things a little bit for those that are maybe newer past investors and active as they're looking into these, they hear these terms all the time, right? But what does that mean to you ground up? And, you know, what is ground up? Maybe what is value add as well? Yeah, definitely. Value add is kind of a blanket term, you know, and of course, when you're doing ground up development, you are adding value to the land. But, you know, usually when most people refer to value add in terms of, you know, commercial real estate, they're talking about adding value to an already existing property, you know, so whether that's a, an office building or an apartment building or, or even just a house, they're somehow adding value typically that involves you know, doing improvements on the property, you know, painting it, putting a new roof on, maybe redoing the interiors, you know, putting in new fixtures and stoves and refrigerators and all that kind of stuff. And in theory, then being able to raise the rents, which in turn increases the value of the property by increasing the net operating income or the NOI. And that's an awesome way to do business, you know, and, I, and I've done it myself. I focus a bit more on ground up development and what is typically meant by ground up development is you know you're taking a property that is you know just the ground and you are developing it by putting you know you are developing it up by putting a building on it so that it is you know the land is now taller than it was before because there's a structure on it and ground up development it can mean a number of different things but the life cycle of a ground up development project is somewhere in between, you know, what we would term raw land, which means, you know, land that, you know, has nothing on it at all, you know, probably no utilities, no buildings, no structures, no zoning or approvals or entitlements or anything on it. It's it's like just dirt and taking that through having a structure on it that is completed that is being used for some kind of use, typically being, you know, leased or rented or owned by somebody, you know, whether that's, you know, an apartment building where you have multiple tenants that are leasing the property, or, you know, whether it's like an industrial building where you have like a big company like, you know, Facebook that puts a data center in it. And there's not really people there, but Facebook is leasing the space to essentially store and operate their equipment. Or maybe you've sold the building to a company like Facebook that still does the same thing. You know, they have their equipment in there, but they're not leasing it from somebody. They just own it. And there's multiple steps to that, to getting from, you know, point A of raw land to point B of a final asset. And development can be, you know, anywhere in between that. So, you know, there's multiple steps there. You know, typically you're going from step one is raw land. And from there, you get that raw land entitled for what it is you want to put on that land. So entitlements will include things like rezoning, making sure that there's proper access to utilities or getting utility commitments from local municipalities or developing a plan to put your own private utilities on the land. And in doing that, essentially, you're approving that land with whatever the governing municipality is, whether that's a city, 
whether that's the county, whether that's the state, approving with them saying like, this is what I want to do with the land. I want to put whatever this thing is on it. And they're saying, yes, we will allow you to do that as long as you come up with a plan that adheres to our laws. So that's kind of step one. You know, step two would be, which would still be considered entitlement, which would be designing whatever that building or thing is, you know, and you have to design, you know, buildings or, you know, whatever adhere to, you know, local codes and, you know, you have to fit within the frameworks that the city have said. So the city may say, yes, we will allow you to put an apartment building there. Well, there's a question of, well, how tall can that apartment building be? How many units can you have per acre of land, you know, and, and all these kinds of things, you know, and, and there will be a lot of different factors to take into account. You know, the city may say, okay, we'll zone you say MF 20, which would stand for multifamily 20 units. So it'd be 20 multifamily units per acre of land. Now, maybe you've gotten approval, you know, let's say you have 10 acres that you're trying to develop and you've been approved for MF 20. Well, so you could put a maximum of 200 units on that piece of land. But in that, the city may have a restriction that says, well, the buildings can't be over 40 feet high. So, well, now you have to work in that. The city may also, or the city or county or whoever may also say, okay, well, for, you know, these units, if you have a two bedroom unit, you need to have two parking spaces per unit. Or, you know, if you have, you know, one bedroom units, you need to have one and a half parking spaces per unit. Or if you have three bedroom units, you have to have three parking spaces for you per unit. So now you got to figure out, okay, well, how much of my 10 acres do I have to set aside for parking? Because I have to have like, I can't put, you know, 200 units if I can't, you know, have, you know, whatever it is, you know, 467 parking spaces or whatever it is for your unit mix. You may also have utility constraints. You know, the city may say, hey, you know, we have water and sewer that goes to this area, but, you know, really the capacity it will only be adequate for, say, 150 units or, you know, however many people that they would, that fire code would say can live in those units. You know, if you have a, a two bedroom apartment, you're generally not allowed to have 20 people living in that apartment unit. You know, the fire marshal will say like, Hey, you can have a maximum of, you know, two people per bedroom, which would mean a maximum of four people per two bedroom apartment unit. So now if you have 200, you know, two bedroom apartment units, you're dealing with, you know, a certain amount of people, and you have to calculate that out with the city's utility director of how much capacity do we have? So there's all of these different things that you have to think about. And the end result may be, oh, well, although I'm zoned for 200 multifamily units, I can't actually fit that many units on this piece of land because, you know, I have to think about parking or I don't have utility capacity or my buildings can't be a certain height. And, you know, for the passive investors out there listening, or even the newer developers, if somebody's trying to sell you a project where they say, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, selling land that's entitled for, you know, 10 acres, that's entitled for 200 multifamily units, you got to be really careful. And it's like, okay, is it actually entitled like full plans for 200 units? Or is it just zoned for that? Because you don't want to go buy a project and say, oh, I'm going to buy this piece of land. And I'll put 200 units on it. I'm going to underwrite the deal so that there's 200 units and base like a pro forma on that only to buy the land and find out you can only get 120. That'll kill your deal. And, you know, you'll be in a really tough spot. Everything has to be one story, right? Exactly. So just a little tip out there for people looking at land and trying to get into development. Don't, you know, make sure you know what you're looking at, which I see a lot of people that, try to sell deals where they sell it that way. And it's, yeah. it's incorrect. A couple of questions for you. When do you own the land versus when you're looking at the entitlements, getting entitlements, working with the city, some of that, what's the process there of, you know, is it under contract or, you know, to when you actually, you know, make an offer compared to when you're actually insuring those things, right. That it is entitled properly or that you're actually getting it entitled. So everybody's a little bit different. You know, people will, close on the land at various, you know, 
point personally, in order for me to want to move forward with the deal, I like to know, you know, before I even go into the deal, how many, you know, units I'm going to be able to get, what my utility capacity is. Like by the time I'm closing on a piece of land, I want to have a fully fleshed out business plan. And by the time I close on the land, the only thing that I have to do is basically follow a checklist. Like, you know, my team and I will put together basically like, this is our project schedule. And these are all the tasks that we need to complete. And we're just essentially working through those. We already know for the most part what the end result is going to be. Now we just actually, you know, have to do the work. Similar to, you know, if you're starting a new business, well, they're going to make you form a business plan. You have to say, I'm going to, you know, take this step and then this step and then this step. I'm going to try to hit these numbers. And, you know, you know what you have to do. You still have to go out and do it. That's the point that I want to be at. You know, there is risk in development. I try to take as much of that out before I close on the land as possible. So typically, you know, I'll have a three to six month due diligence period is what I'll negotiate for, unless the seller has already done some of the due diligence for me. Like I have a a set number of things that I have to figure out before I feel comfortable moving forward. Sometimes I find property where the seller's already done some of that, you know, so for our 330 unit development that we're doing in Seguin, we bought the land from another developer. You know, what he had done is he had bought the land raw and he had zoned it for multifamily. And then because he's a developer, he had actually gone through and figured out, you know, Hey, these are, you know, the number of units that we could probably get, you know, this is the utility capacity. He'd already done, you know, a waters of the U S report. He'd done an environmental report. He'd run some of the third party reports for us. So we only had a 60 day due diligence period, but he already done essentially what would for me have been two months worth of due diligence. So I was like, okay, I'll take that deal because you're already giving me some of the information that I would need to find out. So it's a little dependent there, but you know, I'm always looking to, you know, figure out the same stuff on every deal. And it takes a while, you know, we have another deal right now. It's a townhome deal, 110 units that we'll be building up in Georgetown. I mean, we've been under contract since mid February on that deal, you know, and we're working towards closing now, but you know, that was like a five month due diligence, you know, where we went through everything and developed that plan. That's just how I like to do it. I know some people that will just go out and like buy the land, but you know, that's the riskiest way to do it. In my opinion, I know a guy that did that out near Houston, he went and bought some land and was like, yeah, I'm going to develop this and then went to the city and they were like, no No. yeah you know he was like oh well that sucks and you know i know other people out in the texas hill country that bought a bunch of land and they went into you know they were going to put wells on it because there was no water and they went into the city and were like yeah so we're going to you know subdivide this into you know whatever it is one to two acre you know lots and build houses on them and they're like no you're only going to subdivide it into like five to ten acre parcels and it blew their number but they just bought the land and they paid a premium for it. And so they're kind of in trouble now (laughs) because they did not do that due diligence beforehand. And I think it's so important to do that. Even if you lose money, you know, and I have lost money in due diligence on deals. I've gone into deals. I've put up, you know, earnest money, you know, and lost, you know, I've lost my earnest money. I've lost my, you know, preliminary money that I've spent on engineering and studies. And I mean, it's always better to lose, that money up front than to go into a bad deal, you know, God forbid, bring investors into a deal and then they're losing money. Whenever I'm putting a deal together, you know, I go out, I put the property under contract in my LLC name. I put up the earnest money out of my own pocket. I pay all the due diligence out of my own pocket and I make sure that there's a deal before I start accepting anyone else's money on the deal. That's a good point that that's your process. Anyway, I think that's important for passive investors to know that. But on that thought, what about some key factors you would say passive investors need to consider this before uh, you know, investing in a ground up project or when they're evaluating it, or maybe even some of the risks associated with ground up that they need to be aware of? Well, everything in my mind, everything is about your risk reward ratio, which differs per person, right? You know, some people have a little higher risk 
tolerance. They're willing to take more risk for less money. Other people aren't. And so I always try to, you know, tailor my deals to take, you know, what I feel is an appropriate risk reward ratio into account. So there are certain parts of the development process that are a lot riskier than others. For instance, trying to get land rezoned or zoned in the first place is a lot riskier than working with land that is already zoned. So, you know, as a passive investor, you're going into a project and the sponsor is saying, okay, well, we're buying this land raw and we're going to go rezone it for whatever this thing is. That is a much riskier deal than someone coming in saying like, I'm buying this land, it's zoned for this thing. We're just going to put plans in place to build that thing. You know, the returns may be a little bit lower if the land's already zoned, but it's going to be a lot safer. You know, in my mind, buying, you would think by that logic that buying a property where you already have plans in place is maybe a even safer deal then that's not always the case it depends when those plans were put into place if you're buying a project where plans were approved like three years ago haven't been built you have the potential to hit a lot of issues there and i had a deal where i say that specifically because i had a deal where that happened we bought a property and it had plans in place already you know had full architecturals and civil plans and you know we went in to start building and the city came to us and said, oh, well, FEMA updated their flood maps. And now part of your land is in the floodplain where it wasn't before when those plans were originally approved. And, you know, FEMA is like God there, <laughs> you know, like you can't go against FEMA very easily. So they were like, you guys got to change your civil plans and account for more on-site detention. Like, sorry. And we were like, oh, well, that was never disclosed to us. Yeah. And that actually happened. Like FEMA updated the flood maps in between us closing on the land and us going into start construction, which was like a, a four month gap. So it was like super bad timing there. We were able to figure that out. And, you know, the, and the deal is still going well. It's just, you know, that could have been a major issue there. So always be careful about who did the plans and when they were done. That's a great thought or just a question for a passive investor to, to ask a developer, right? Because if you've not been involved in any kind of development, you wouldn't know to ask that, I don't think. Any other quick questions before we have to move to another segment? Any other quick questions though you would say, hey, as a passive investor, you need to ask the developer this. I think you got to look at the developer's pro forma and see what they're putting in for their construction costs and then go confirm that that construction cost is feasible. Because a lot of developers that I know, you know, they don't have the background that I have with actual like construction and, you know, budgeting expertise. You know, there's a lot of people that will, you know, call themselves developers, but really what they do is they just go out and like hire somebody to do it for them. And they're really just like a money guy. You know, they bring in money and they go pay somebody to do it. And if they don't actually have knowledge of what it costs to, to build something, they may go and get a bid from a general contractor who will lowball the bid in order to get the job. They think that the number is accurate, but they're going to get hit with a bunch of change orders later on down the project, which is going to blow the budget up. So always make sure that you double check the developer's numbers that are on their pro forma. Also make sure that you understand exactly where the project is like that is the number one most important thing is you have to understand what you are actually being presented as because somebody saying like it's a ground up development for this many units it's like that can mean so many things like are they entitled for that is the land already zoned is this actually feasible you know what do their numbers say those are all you know types of questions to ask and then try to you know basically get a second opinion. You know, you go to the doctor, you take your car and whatever it is, you go and get a second opinion, take that developer's pro forma, go bring it to somebody else. You know, I mean, if you bring it to another developer that's trying to get you into their deal, they may say a bunch of, you know, negative stuff about it. So always take everything with a grain of salt. But, you know, if somebody start, you know, if you take one developer's pro forma and bring it to somebody else and they go like, well, this doesn't sound right. Or they say, you know, like, oh, well, this person said that this was a, you know, 200 unit development. Well, they don't even have the land zoned for that. They're just like thinking that they're going to get it zoned for that. Well, then you got to look at the returns 
times and say, well, what returns are they offering me? Are they offering me like a 15% annual return for a project that's going to require land to be rezoned? That's not an appropriate amount of reward for the risk you're taking on. You might want to see more like you know twenty five percent returns or thirty percent returns for land rezone, and just you know, you know, you got to understand the deal there. If you work with good sponsors that have you know good ethics, you know it's less of a problem. But you know, you don't always know how people are going to react in times of stress. You know, and that's, that's sure. kind of unfortunate. Everything sounds rosy at the very beginning when it sounds like everyone's going to make a lot of money. <laughs> Right. No, that's some good questions, some good thoughts for, I, I think, even active investors, right? You know, as they are approaching projects or to be prepared for these questions, I know I would want to know those things as a passive investor as well. You know, if you're investing or when investing in a development, to get to know the sponsor, you know, no doubt, I want to get to know them and, and understand, hey, what's the likelihood of how they're going to perform in hard times, right? It's only a matter of time, I feel like, till, you know, there's some kind of deal that, didn't work out the way you planned, right? As an operator. I mean, it's just part of the business. You have to prepare for you know the unexpected, right? Or expect the unexpected. Andrew, I'm grateful for just talking through ground up development and, and in detail. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you before we move to another segment. Yeah. So people can go to my website, which is www.irongall, I-R-O-N-G-A-L-L investments.com. That's my company. You know, I founded it, I run it, you know, all of my projects are through Iron Gall Investments. So you can learn a lot more about our projects, about my team, about myself and, you know, my background through there. You know, if people want to get in touch with me directly, they can email me. My email is andrew at irongallinvestments.com. You know, and you can also look me up on, you know, LinkedIn and Facebook. Huge on social media right now. I guess I probably should do a little bit more uh, self-promotion there, but, uh, but you can still find me there. If you want to, you know, connect there and send me a message or whatever it is, I'm always happy to chat with people, make new connections and help out where I can. So, you know, get in touch with me and yeah, we can kind of go from there. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope you have liked and subscribed to the show. Please tell your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show. And I hope that you are learning and growing. Don't forget to go to lifebridgecapital.com where you can start investing today.